Our next speaker is certainly not shy of an opinion or two, um, maybe, maybe a bit like me really. Uh, as Managing Director of the UK's most prominent brokerage, brokerages, uh, our next guest has always strived to ensure that all brokers and lenders remain close and work together towards high standards of professionalism, whilst retaining a good image for the sector. He's a great advocate of the FNI conferences. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mr Richard Hoggart. Um, I need a new picture. I look like I've eaten Freddie Mercury. Um, Thanks. Um, Seamus, the beard thing, I hadn't even noticed. I'm, I'm just loving the quiff. Sweet that. Nice. Um, last little bit of housekeeping. Um, my heckle threats are getting a little bit high now, so it's not too late for Alan Carson or Simon Barris to off to the bar if they want to. Uh, but that's an aside. Uh, I'll get cracking. This has to count down. Go. Um, two years ago, Andy asked me to open the first frontline broker conference. I used the opportunity to address my thoughts on the broker market and the issues we faced. Today I intend to discuss a similar thing, this time I've got a little bit longer to do it, lucky you. The commitment of Frontline, by the way, to visualise and deliver a conference centred around the intermediary sector uh, should be recognised, I think, as an extremely positive and constructive forum, so thanks for that, Frontline. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I stop now? <laughs> Um, it's great for us to develop new ideas and better understand how we all have a place in the market. It's also a fantastic, as we said earlier, networking opportunity. And later on, hopefully, a good chance to go home with a bit of uh, interesting memorabilia. Uh, I'm sure you'll be fueling us with alcohol. I know you, you have well learned the way to get a good bit out of people. There's no doubt about that. You don't keep that a secret. I'm here to talk about the future of consumer motor finance brokers and the standards involved in those brokers. There's no jokes now, I'm afraid, just some intense beliefs that I've got about where the industry needs to go. You won't agree with everything I say and it might piss some of you off by the end. But I've strong opinions on the subject and Andy has invited me to, uh, to share them. So I will. Over the last two years, there's been lots of developments just under the surface, uh, certainly in many aspects that affect brokers. We all know the economic climate has been tough and remains very difficult and the market of course is in, can, increasingly competitive but during this time brokers should have modernised, should have seen where change is required and prepared for the opportunity and threats uh, that are present now. And although the hearing now is obviously important, I'm more concerned with looking ahead to the future. This industry has given me a lot over the last 20 years. But realistically, I now need to secure my business for the next 20 years. And to do that, I have to try and be aware of where the business needs to go and ensure that we plan properly and we execute that plan, that plan correctly. Not all brokers need plan too much for the future because I don't think everyone is necessarily going to be part of it. Perhaps it's not yet apparent who those brokers are, particularly to them. But if we examine what leads me to say this, then it may become clearer in some people's minds. I say this now because I think the differences between brokers are becoming greater. Much greater than the similarities between us all. I used to believe that the United Broker Front was a way to deal with any problems that we have with industry image. But I no longer think that's appropriate or necessary. I think events brought on by the natural development taking place in the landscape around the market opportunity will deliver the changes needed to that over time. That said, it's not too late for us to become more aligned, but that will require considerable will amongst all the brokers. We've all seen that events can overtake us. Back in 2008, sudden panic in the market engulfed us all, tons of uncertainty. We should have learned then that we have no control over key aspects in the broker market, certainly for either demand for the product or ability to supply it. What we should have learned is that there's no divine rights for us to exist and that the motor finance market would survive without brokers. It wouldn't prosper, but it would survive. 
So counter elements and the threats and competitiveness that exist in dealer induced market. Some brokers have concentrated on internet derived leads. Half one, dead impressed with the developments in this sector over the last couple of years. Although internet leads represent um, a highly labour intensive uh, business source, it's an increasing market size obviously. The main players I think have stolen a huge march on the more established dealer focused operations and despite most brokers looking to move into this area as an additional stream, the reality is that we are way years behind in fact I'd say uh, the few that have established themselves in this market and I implore them for that. Particularly on the basis that they pursued this channel when non-prime lenders were really struggling. Um, with non-prime coming back strongly and by creating well-optimized and functioning websites, the main internet brokers have a great opportunity to prosper both now and in the long term. Um, for dealer-based brokers, that's us, the challenges continue to come our way. The size of the challenges might have been underestimated or were still completely missed or even worse still by some brokers completely ignored. The fact is that the experience of events overtaking us again is happening again as I speak. It might not be as obvious as it was back in 2008, nonetheless, elements beyond our control are aligning to threaten brokers with poor forward vision. All's not lost, you the police know. Depending on how you visualise the role of the broker will very much dictate how it will already have taken effect. Despite the size of the threat of legislation, it presents a great opportunity. Commission disclosure could be a good thing. Despite the lack of true justification, market research indicates there's still customer suspicion about the motives and practices within the retail motor industry. This is largely a misplaced, but not wholly. There are still practices around the edges of the industry that need to change, and it frustrates me that it often takes legislation to act as a catalyst. The threat is not the various pieces of legislation themselves, more so how we opted to respond to it or ignore it, or how we're dealing with it now. Difficult and embarrassing as it is to admit, there remains an element of corruption in our industry. Some people continue to call it incentivisation, but right-minded people should call it bribery. Rewarding people disproportionately or enticing people to make a business decision based on personal reward at the disadvantage of their employer or to restrict fair competition is bribery. It's not an opinion, it's a fact. The vast majority of us will agree that it has to stop, but some brokers continue to fuel it. Hidden voucher exchanges or the latest tablets, what's the difference? Where dealer staff receive personal persuasion without the knowledge or approval of their directors is literally criminal. The brokers involved in these practices need to stop it now. I hope you would agree. If it takes a combination of the Bribery Act and Commission Disclosure to stop this stain of illicit payments between dinosaurs, then that's an embarrassment to our industry. That's how I see it. But at least that might make it stop. How do you declare or hide your £300 commission and your £100 vouchers without breaking several laws? But funders too have a role to play in this. If a broker transacts a deal as a result of bribery, then that surely might reflect badly on that broker in the event of a management investigation, because it's going to be their name that's likely to appear on the log. So I would implore all funders to add clauses to their broker agreements, making it clear that any evidence of bribery used to win business will result in termination of the broker's facility. Commission disclosure in its own right is not a reason to be concerned. It's an opportunity for an intermediary to handle a transaction on behalf of the dealer, or at least help a dealer design a process that works for a scenario where there are multiple lending options that might be offered. The use of joint venture partnerships between brokers and funders would simplify this area. For brokers to have long-term stability and a more measured and projectionable income stream, the joint venture model should be the future of relationships between brokers and funders. Sharing the profitability rather, of an agreement rather than a transactional model mostly employed by brokers now should create a closer working relationship and a better understanding of the true profitability of an agreement and how the earnings of a successful portfolio can better be distributed. This does of course come with risk but that simply increases the responsibility of the broker to ensure the quality of the introducer and of course the customer. 
and to make sure each is better screened and monitored. Despite Commission disclosure being the newest piece of legislation to focus on, we mustn't forget the responsibilities that we have with existing legislation. Consumer Credit Directive has been around for a while now, and maybe brokers are thinking it doesn't pose much of a threat. As long as the boxes are ticked and the forms are signed, then everything should be fine. I don't think so. In fact, I think this is just storing up a whole heap of trouble for the future. If we are to be, as brokers, professional intermediaries, it's our responsibility to insist that we cover the bases properly and ensure that both of us and the dealer is properly covered in the event that the customer later expresses some level of dissatisfaction in the way that they were handled. This can only be adequately achieved by creating a full process that definitively ensures that the customer is the right finance product and that they have been consistently and categorically approved of their treatment throughout the process as of record to confirm this. Otherwise, claims management companies will be looking to exploit any area where it can be argued that the intermediary was not diligent. As professional forward-thinking intermediaries, we must deliver a full legislative proposition to our dealer accounts and demonstrate our full competence to our funding partners. We must show them how we can organise compliance and how we can creatively help them to use legislation to improve their own position with each customer. If a broker fails to be part of the solution, by default you're part of the complication, part of the problem. We have to move on from how and why we existed in the past and not rely on old relationships, old habits and cronyism. There's a clear distinction to be made on surviving on casual business where there's no great benefit to our dealer and building strong formal relationships at board level based on bringing real value and positive results. Which one of those has the best long-term prospects? One area that requires no need for improvement is product portfolio. If there is one skill that all brokers possess, it's the ability to identify, select, obtain, integrate, assimilate a great depth in the range of products. I don't think anyone would dispute this, and it's not really an area that needs any further discussion. However, it is also easy than ever for a dealer to go out and acquire all the same relationships. Why shouldn't we do it? Why deal with the broker instead? <clears throat> now we could all trip out all the usual lines to do with personal service, understanding the funders, managing multiple dealer relationships, etc. And indeed there's merit in all those arguments. But this is 2012, this is the Frontline Conference, and therefore we must recognise that access to our service and delivery of results is the single most influential characteristic that should determine our success or failure when we're trying to win major accounts. The ability to organise your portfolio of products, package it and deliver it accurately via technology is not a new concept, but it's now a critical one. It's only going to become more important as the market continues to adopt systems such as deal track, and the expectation level of the dealer grows. I don't dispute there are many dealers who aren't yet motivated by technology or the approach of technology, but realistically, where do they fit into the market in five years' time? Intermediaries will need to look down the line at what's required for them to deliver sales for dealers and then turn that into a technology-based solution that they can use to differentiate themselves from their competition and win and retain major accounts. Let's drive the technology agenda and not rely on waiting to hear what the market thinks it needs. As Henry Ford said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses that eat less. This technology needs to go beyond online proposals, document delivery and payment calculators. It needs to become smarter. It needs to integrate into the major dealer management systems. It needs to present the right deal to the customer before they leave the showroom. And it needs to help the business manager or the salesman, whoever's responsible, to structure deals that work. These systems will be available off the shelf for all brokers eventually, but we should all, as brokers, be thinking about where we are in our development cycle and whether we have the capabilities to deliver the next generation of systems, whether we can do it under our own steam or not. If we can't, you need a technology partner and you need to invest in that, and quickly I would suggest. 
The kind of technology we need should allow intermediaries to make faster and better decisions about how we accommodate each customer's individual needs. To do this accurately, we need bureau data. Access to the full data from the three main providers is an issue that needs to be resolved on logical and commercial grounds. The present closed shop mentality of reciprocity is archaic and nonsensical to me. <coughs> I accept that the lenders are the final decision makers and that they feed the data to the bureau, but so what? Why should that create the divine right to treat the creators of the transaction, that can be us, as if we can't be trusted to see the data ourselves? At present, if an intermediary wants key share or insight data, then we must be sponsored by a lender. That in itself is a process that requires too much hoop jumping and puts unworkable limitations on how you are allowed to use that data even when you've got it. It makes the integration into systems questionable and subject to interpretation whether you can either do it or not. I don't agree that credit profile data should be so protected. Consumer credit licences are there to regulate the fitness of an organisation to operate in finance. And the Data Protection Registrar decides whether we can be trusted to keep a secret. Why then don't the bureaus recognise this next end rate freedom? For us to access the data on a commercial basis, therefore aiding our ongoing development of technology without the clumsy letters of consent and meeting reciprocity rules. Perhaps if we as intermediaries push up our standards, then brokers might get more respect in areas like this rather than often what we get, which is suspicion and contempt. We facilitate the transaction. Without that, in many cases, particularly non-prime, no data would even exist. Why aren't we trusted to buy it? I'd love the opportunity, I know some of these guys are here, to sit down with the three main providers and establish whether it's them or indeed the score members who are artificially controlling the market. Whichever it is, we need to try and force sensible change here. If we can improve standards to the universally high levels, then there is an ex excellent long-term prognosis for all brokers. Many funders already see brokers as their sole route to market. We did. It should be our aspiration to increase the number of funding partners who look to this model in the future. We could already argue that we are more effective than the one-dimensional representation that's presented by several major finance houses. If we could convince such organisation that brokers were a professional and effective channel, then why wouldn't more lenders use us as a solace route to market, ahead of the traditional in-house team of boots on the ground? After all, using brokers is considerably cheaper and a lot less management intensive. The time's come for funders and dealers and brokers themselves to ask questions and insist on answers. Our funders should be asking what kind of broker they want to introduce business to them. The answer should be motivated by dealing with ethical and transparent partners. When a broker is using any funder's product to transact a deal, then they are representing that funder at that exact moment. The lender must insist that the broker employs the highest integrity and diligence in every aspect of their relationship with the dealer and their management of the customer. Do your brokers take responsibility? Would they be open to a joint venture model? Or is it all about high upfront commission and short debit back periods? Dealers also need to think more about what they can and should expect from their broker. <coughs> Dealers have a right to expect brokers to deliver solutions that make a real difference to their results and deliver it in an efficient manner with innovation and clarity. The element of business that brokers handle for major dealers is small relative to the size of their overall finance requirement. It could be seen as white noise, but nevertheless, it's an area that holds potential to generate further car sales and, of course, profit. Broker must demonstrate practices that get positive results whilst ensuring that the dealer does not require any more management time that is proportionate to the segment of business in question. Finally, you'll be pleased to know, the intermediaries ourselves need to make a decision. Does the way you do business now really work for you and more importantly, will it work for you in the future? Then think about a future where your competition is at the forefront of legislative management, integrity and transparency, at the forefront of IT innovation, and aspires to compete with the major finance houses for accounts with the major dealers. At that point, ask yourself the question again. 
I know much of Islam comes across as negative, however, we must be aware that some of our mentality will lead to negative results if we don't all move up again. If there's a will to pull together more, what better way to demonstrate this than uniting to raise money for Ben? Where's Nigel? Nigel. Hi, Nigel. This is the charity that supports the motor industry, that supports us. I promised Nigel Williams that we would embark on an adventure in 2013 to raise money for the cause. I'd be delighted to be approached by anybody that would like to get involved with the project. Hopefully brokers can really start to contribute to Ben, because I don't think we have in the past and enjoy a great international tracking experience or whatever we decide to do. What I'm trying to get across is that as brokers we have a landscape that is better than ever in terms of opportunity. <coughs> I truly believe that the legislative scene advances in IT in such a varied product range gives us the best chance we've ever had to seize a place at the core of point of sale finance. But we can't do it by hanging on to old notions of jolly boys and good old fashioned personal service. Let's realise our true potential and up our game right across the industry. Brokers are entrepreneurs at heart. Let's remember why we decided to do this job and make sure we can take it as far as we can. Thank you. Where's your beard gone, mate? Well, I like the quiff, fantastic. Yeah, you have so much behind you, nodding your head a lot and shaking your head a bit, so <laughs> I'm sure you've got a question or two for Richard. Absolutely, yeah. Well, first of all, Richard, thank you for the comments today. I started seeing it following you. Question away. Um, <laughs> uh, you mentioned compliance and mm -hmm. brokers' uh, role in compliance. Um, what's your view about the next space from a broker perspective where the CMCs are going to go for you and go for us as lenders? In particular relevance with the RFT guidance that's just mm -hmm. come out and the SCA, who knows what that's going to bring against you. Do you think there's another area that you're going to particularly focus on? Yeah, there's actually somebody who can answer that question a lot better than me from a DSG perspective, but I'll give it a go. But I'm sure uh, our new development director, Kurt Bradbury, uh, will be worried about what I'm going to say. Um, Kurt's recently joined us, and that's one of the areas that he's got a lot of expertise in. And I think it's some of the conversations I've had with Kurt over the last few, few months, maybe the last 12 months, that's made us think about our approach in this area. As I was saying before, you know, you've got to go beyond ticking boxes. You've got to look at, you've got to try and have a vision about what might, what problems might come. And of course, when you take your claims management companies, all they're looking to do is exploit loopholes, exploit things that weren't a rule, but could have been interpreted as being so, and make a point on that. So all we've got to try and do, as brokers in particular, is make sure that we close the door and prevent that from happening. And the way to prevent that is taking things a lot further than just making sure the boxes are ticked. We've got to make sure alongside our dealers that the customers are properly qualified into the product that they're in. You know, if, we, if they tell you to only change your car every two years, an example that Kurt gave me, if you only change your car every two years and you stick with the five year HP, is that not a bit questionable? Could that not be picked up by a claims management company when they come back and they've got negative equity after two years and they say, well, nobody offered me a two year PCP deal? That in itself is an issue. You know, beyond the, I don't remember signing this and I didn't know that was my EPR and all that. You know, I think when it comes to that, we've got to make sure that we've got on record customers, whether that's um, beyond signatures, verbally or on video, saying, I understand this agreement, I agree with it, I'm happy with it. Because that should be enough to deter the claims management companies in the future. You know, they're not going to try and take you to court if you've got customers that says, yeah, I know exactly what was signing and he's on tape. Because it's it was too much effort. They'll go with the next guy who didn't do that. So, it is about covering your arse at the end of the day, but whilst you're covering your arse, you can help the dealers. I think it's our duty to, work, is to help the dealers make sure that they're covered, because when it comes to the broker landscape, it's a bit more complicated. There's more funders that we might try that deal. You know, okay, we might rather deal with you, but we might also have tried to do that deal with George for, for a money way at the back or whatever. So you've got, you're in a situation where you've got multiple proposals floating around here. And that in itself could be deemed as damaging the customer. So it's very important that we take care to make sure that we cover everything and that we explain to the dealer what the potential situation might be and how we intend to deal with that for the dealer. That, that, that's how we see it on, on the, the CCD. Hope that long-windedly answers your question. Any questions? Well, you've got no time for 
Actually, yeah, Shane has nicked most of my questions, so this is really just a full of what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've heard it said that, you know, the compliance burden on dealers has taken a lot of management time uh, from the business manager role. Um, and just really following on from what you just said, how much do you think it's the responsibility of the broker to take on some of that burden of compliance? And how does that change the business manager role? I'm not sure it's necessarily our role to take on the burden of the compliance. I think we're all going to be burdened in some way with a level of compliance. What it, what it is our responsibility to do is make sure that we don't create any further problem for the dealer by our activities at the back end. And that we, if we're the guys transacting the deal for them, that we make sure that particular case is watertight on behalf of them. By doing that, we should remove any future potential burden from them. Because if any complaint comes up, we're the intermediary, we're the guys who've, who've covered it off, we'll deal with the complaint for you, you don't need to worry about it. So I think the, the letters are going to come regardless, and there's going to be a lot of administration that comes from this, just like the has been from PPI. It's not started yet, because the PPI guys aren't, you know, still being fed at the moment, and they haven't got the time to get crack on with it. But once they start getting hungry again, it's likely that that's where they're going to go. And they're going to pick on the easiest target, just like, you know, the burglar doesn't rob the guy with the bars in his window, they don't want the guy who's left his front door open. So that's what you've got to make sure we do. We've got to do that alongside the dealer and take away the risk of that particular transaction that we did for the dealer. And then keep doing that. That's why I say. Guys, I think it's a good point here just to uh, welcome two, two chaps to the room. Uh, guy Prince and Jonathan LaRue. Jonathan, you're an ex-golf pro, I understand. And Guy, you're a 4 before dealer down on the south coast and uh, we've been working together over what, five, six months now. And you're coming into the market as a new entrant in, uh, in December, I understand. We're helping you with the launch of your system. What's your thoughts on listening? Obviously Richard's been in the game a long time. What's your thoughts on his comments about, you know, how, how selling, sending a message about how brokers should conduct their affairs? What do you think? Um, well, yes, as someone with a lot of experience at the moment, so I understand a lot of what he said, but yes, it, it reinforces what we need to do to treat customers fairly and, and to, to cover things so that yeah, they're dealt with properly. Jonathan, you know, we, you and I have talked long and hard about you know, how you're coming into the, uh, the business and I think uh, today at the beginning actually said, are you mad? Why don't you just keep swinging your clubs and travelling the world? But you know, how excited are you to come into the market as a broker? Um, I, I think it's an incredible change for me. Um, like Andy says, all I've ever known all my life is playing golf and uh, going around the world. But I actually started another business in uh, a private medical company uh, six years ago. And the business um, knowledge that I gained from that, I think we're gonna take into this new business. And it's interesting um, listening to you, Richard, that being in the medical industry that I'm in currently, and we've done very well with that, you have to be ethically spot on with dealing with patients. Um, from my knowledge of the modes traders, uh, historically it hasn't quite been like that. Um, but I'm wanting to bring that ethic into our, our broker um, business as well. So what you're talking about totally goes in with what I think. Um, and I uh, hope a lot of, your, of, of the other brokers actually go along with that in the future as well. I think I'd like to, you know, personally welcome you to, to the industry. I'm looking forward to getting you guys up and going in uh, November, December time. I think it's, I think it's great, you know, obviously two very out professional people coming into the industry. I think it sends good news out. So if the suppliers, you know, seriously would like to take some time to speak to these guys. I guess I, at the beginning I thought you were a bit crackers, but anyway, now it's really good to, for new people to come in. I think you can't let me uh, up, uplift them. Yeah, we did try and put it up, but no, you're determined, you know, you're, uh, you're coming at the market. And I think it's a really, uh, a really fresh, uh, fresh bit of news. So welcome. Okay, Richard, thank you for your time. Okay. Um, our uh, Richard.